You're watching F1 Technical Analysis, brought to you by Aramco. The Brabham BT46B, better known as the fan car, only raced once in Formula 1, but it made a profound impact and is celebrated to this day as a beacon of technical ingenuity. Most F1 fans know the basic story of Gordon Murray's car, which won the 1978 Swedish Grand Prix in the hands of Niki Lauda on its sole racing appearance. As an answer to the ground effect innovation of Team Lotus, a large fan attached to the rear of the Brabham created a similar effect by sucking air out from below the car, pulling it closer to the ground and sealing the underfloor with the side skirts. But there's a lot more to the story than that, as well as some legends about it that aren't quite accurate. So we've dug into the detail of one of F1's most legendary cars to bring you some facts you may not have known. And to make it easier to understand this famous car, we're very grateful to Formula Passion for sharing their tremendous 3D model of the Brabham BT46B with us. Alfa Romeo made the fan car necessary. Team Lotus had first run a ground effect car in 1977, but it wasn't until 1978 and the Lotus 79 that everybody realised the potential of such concepts. It triggered a rush for rivals to create their own ground effect designs. But Brabham had a problem. Its car was powered by the chunky flat 12 Alfa Romeo boxer engine. The architecture meant any attempt to create conventional ground effect Venturi tunnels was fundamentally compromised, primarily thanks to the cylinder heads being in the way. As engine designer Carlo Chiti said, it was effectively impossible. This led to consideration of a twin chassis design which proved too heavy, then the idea of the fan car. Keaty also got to work designing an Alfa Romeo V12 engine, which was used in the 1979 Brabham. While news got out about the fan car long before it appeared in public, Brabham had conducted its testing in private at Brands Hatch and at Alfa Romeo's Bolocco Proving Ground and wanted to keep details of its design hidden, even at Anderstorp. The result was the fans were covered. But whereas today teams would manufacture their own custom-fitted shroud, Brabham's mechanics opted for a much simpler solution and found dustbin lids that happened to fit perfectly over the fan. The fan was not driven by its own motor. Instead, through a complicated system that connected the fan to the lower shaft of the gearbox and incorporated no less than four clutches, it was powered by the Alfa Romeo engine. That meant around 30 brake horsepower went to the fan rather than to the wheels. But that was an acceptable trade-off because the downforce and corner speed gain was worth significant. While the fan was obviously to create downforce by sucking air from the underfloor, which was sealed by the side skirts, this could not be its primary purpose. That's because of the way the regulations were worded. In a change for 1978, the rule banning movable aerodynamic devices included a caveat. This stated that movable aerodynamic devices were permitted if their primary purpose was not aerodynamic. There were two effects of the fan on the Brabham. One was to help suck the car to the ground, but the other was to increase the efficiency of the water radiator mounted horizontally on top of the Alfa Romeo engine. So to prove legality, all Brabham needed to do was show that more than 50% of the effect was cooling. As expected, five teams launched protests even before the race started in Sweden – Williams, McLaren, Lotus, Tyrrell and Surtees. The basis for these protests concerned not only the primary function, but also whether the skirts were not fitted entirely to the sprung part of the car as the regulations demanded. The Commission Sportive Internationale had ruled the car legal before the event and did so again in face of this protest, finding that the skirts were fixed to the sprung part of the bodywork, and, crucially for the fan, that the primary function was cooling even though the aerodynamic effect was recognised. Measurements obtained when the CSI visited Brabham's headquarters established that more than 55% of the power of the fan was for cooling, although obviously Brabham's primary reason for introducing the fan was aerodynamic. The fan itself features seven blades and required an enormous amount of work to get right. Originally, the hope was that the car might be ready for the Monaco Grand Prix in early May rather than for Sweden six weeks later. A thermodynamic specialist, David Cox, was engaged to work on the characteristics of the fan. The fan components themselves originally came from a tank, 
at first plastic, then glass fibre reinforced nylon, these had to be beefed up significantly with magnesium blades cast. As Gordon Murray explains in his excellent book, One Formula, 50 Years of Car Design, the hub of the fan was also reproduced at the last minute in solid aluminium, following another catastrophic failure. But despite the lack of testing of the final version of the fan, it proved reliable enough for Lauda to win as Anderstor. Brabham drivers Nicky Lauda and John Watson were under strict instructions not to reveal just how quick the fan car was. That included being warned about how much they revved the engine in the pits, given it visibly sucked the car to the ground. But it also meant that, on the instructions of Brabham team owner Bernie Eccleston, they ran on a heavy fuel load in qualifying to ballast what Nicky Lauda called the vacuum cleaner in his famous book to Helen Back. That explains why Mario Andretti took pole position for Lotus with an advantage of around 7 tenths of a second over the two Brabhams. In the race, Lauda said he played cat and mouse with Andretti before overtaking him easily and winning with what he called embarrassing ease. Progress is a race that has no end. After every finish line, another challenge awaits. How can Aramco continue to push innovation in a sport at the forefront of technology? This is how. Discover how Aramco and the Aston Martin Formula One team aim to meet Formula One's sustainable fuel targets. Aramco, powered by how. It's often said that the fan car was banned after its one and only race, but this isn't strictly true, even though Brabham withdrew it from competition. The CSI analysis of the car concluded that it was conclusively legal according to the regulations, with the wording changes to outlaw it only coming in for 1979. And while the CSI claimed that there was a ban in 1978, there was a lot more to this story. Brabham team owner Bernie Eccleston understood that his position within FOCA, the Formula One Constructors Association that he headed and that was the foundation of his growing power in Formula One, was compromised by the fan car's dominant performance and the potential cost implications of rivals having to respond. So he was persuaded to drop it, despite it being legal, creating what could be presented as a ban for the rest of 1978, but in reality, wasn't. The Brabham BT46B was only Gordon Murray's first attempt at a fan car. It was effectively a cut and shut job, adapting the existing BT46 to make the most of the concept. But Murray was already working on a bespoke fan car, the Brabham BT47. That car never raced, in fact it was never built, given the rule changes that outlawed such designs for 1979. There were two key changes in the nascent design. Firstly, the speed of the fan would be variable, as Murray explains in the book One Formula, 50 Years of Car Design. This would allow it to generate ground effect downforce in the corners, but not sap so much power on the straights. Secondly, the area of the underfloor was increased to maximise downforce. With fan cars banned for 1979, Murray instead penned the Brabham BT48. Unreliable and still compromised by a chunky Alfa Romeo engine even though it was now a V12, Brabham managed only 8th in the Constructors' Championship. While the fan car raced only once, it did compete in a time trial event at Donington Park on June 3rd 1978. This was actually the competitive debut for the car. It was one of just 5 cars entered for the non-championship Gunnar Nilsson Memorial Trophy. That wasn't enough for a race, but the cars ran in what was effectively a glorified qualifying session. Nelson Piquet drove the car and finished fourth in an event won by Williams driver Alan Jones. Hopefully we filled in a few gaps in your knowledge about this famous car's brief but brilliant F1 story. Thanks for watching F1 Technical Analysis, brought to you by Aramco.